So we will continue our coverage of uh, air pollution control technologies as related to indoor air. Often we can see uh, multi-stage purifiers uh, in the market. Essentially they will contain some pre-filter. If your red color is the incoming uh, sort of unclean or dirty gas or dirty air, these pre-filters will be removing the larger particles. Then this may be followed by uh, even finer uh, filters or activated carbon which will adsorb the pollutants. Sometimes this is followed by an antibacterial coating uh, passing through an antibacterial coating and any other technology which could, which could be photocatalytic oxidation or plasma and may not necessarily, ne may not necessarily be a filter but some technology. Then uh, often final step or a semi-final step is a HEPA filter which we know can lead to 99.7% uh, removal of particles in the range 0.3 micrometer or more. Then we have the germicidal UV radiation which is essentially to remove the microbes. This is an example of for example a UV lamp. It emits radiation in the UVC range generally or UVA range. So UVC range being 100 to 280 nanometer, UVA range being 315 to 400 nanometer. Often these lamps are at around 254 nanometer wavelength and at this wavelength they are also the rays are germicidal. So given enough time and lamp power we may find uh, the inactivation of microbes happening. How this happens is that the radiation can penetrate the cell and deactivate the DNA and this essentially then deactivates the bacteria, fungi and viruses. Of course, some bacteria and spores are known to be resistant to UVC and therefore one may need to increase either the exposure time or the power of the lamp so that these bacteria or spores, uh, or spores can essentially get deactivated or destroyed. The issues uh, with such germicidal UV radiation lamps is that direct exposure to humans may cause uh, some skin and eye irritation as well. These lamps are easy to operate because all we need to do is turn on the light but they are, have high capital cost and sometimes also electricity consumption. Another issue is that UV lamps can enhance the indoor air photochemistry generally those kind of reactions that are driven by UV radiation and this photochemistry can then lead to the production of compounds such as ozone and hydroxyl radicals which we know can lead to the production of secondary organic pollutants. Then we have the gaseous pollutants controlled by the method of sorption. Generally it is adsorption which is the capture of the pollutants by physical or chemical means on the free surfaces and one may have uh, sorb sorbents such as activated carbon, zeolites, activated alumina, silica gel and polymers. One can have physical absor adsorption on non-porous solids or such as graphite or one can have chemical absorption such as of gases such as carbon monoxide on transition metals or other uh, sort of sorption materials. The performance of removal of such equipment then depends on the concentration of uh, sorbate in the airstream, the total area of the adsorbent, the so total surface area of the adsorbent that is available for sorption to take place the presence of any other gases which may which potentially may interfere with the adherence of sorbate to the sorbent uh, sorbate to the adsorbent uh, so depends on which gases are present or vapors are present and the relative humidity of the experimental uh, or uh, reaction conditions also the physical and chemical characteristics Sorbents essentially or potentially can be even incorporated into construction materials and they may also accumulate the microorganisms that are hazardous to human health in addition to the chemical or physical um, pollutants. 
but the thing is that since these uh, pollutants are being attached to the surface we would need to have periodic replacement or regeneration of the adsorbent material so that we can keep our removal efficiency intact and also so that we may prevent re-emissions because once the site the sorbent adsorbent site uh, start to become saturated uh, with the pollutant if if the things uh, if the sites are really full we may have pollutants coming back up or or not being adsorbed at all so we need to do replacement or regeneration then we have photocatalytic oxidation which is basically the apparatus has a high surface area coated with a catalyst for example tio2 so that when this uh, catalyst uh, this area coated with catalyst is irradiated with uv light photochemical reactions will occur with the resulting creation of the reactive hydroxyl oh radical now these oh radicals will then oxidize the gaseous pollutants that are adsorbed on the catalyst surface uh, tio2 is the most popular catalyst due to its low cost uh, apparent low or non toxicity and uh, compatibility and effectiveness but the issue with such photocatalytic oxidation is the possible formation of hazardous substances because oh radical may you know react with the available gaseous compounds and cause secondary aerosols or secondary pollutants so that is always possible and there is a high cost of catalyst media and uh, in a document by us epa it is written that the effectiveness of such method is undocumented the others are sort of the plasma air cleaners plasma can be seen as a cloud of uh, highly ionized gas so these plasma air cleaners apply high voltage discharge to the incoming gas and this may break the chemical bonds of the pollutant it has been shown or uh, said that the removal efficiency of up to 90% can be achieved for some gases and particles and sometimes uh, these can also remove the microorganisms now the thing is that the disadvantages are also there which are quite similar to the photocatalytic oxidation which we saw previously or of uv radiation because this kind this uh, processes again can lead to formation of ozone uh, sometimes co and formaldehyde then we have also our apparatus or instruments called ozonizers which will generate ozone molecules from ambient oxygen by high voltage discharge or uv radiation and they will claim that ozone is somewhat pure oxygen and will destroy the contaminants but the issue here issue is that uh, when we have high levels of ozone the ozone basically could lead to the formation of hazardous secondary pollutants which essentially means we are going to have the health issues we have already seen in our chapter uh, or the week on the chemical reactions that volatile organic compounds such as terpenes can react with ozone forming ozone and form secondary pollutants in general it has been not advisable to be using ozonizer because of the uh, potential chemical reactions and the health impacts associated with more higher levels of ozone in the indoor air then we have also biological air purification methods the idea here is to adapt the microorganisms adapt microorganisms in a way that they can eliminate or transform the gaseous pollutants also when we are talking about biological air purification we have a wide range of microbial communities that are available such as different types of bacteria different uh, fungi microalgae and yeast which in principle all of them can be adopted and used but of course it depends on the characteristics of the uh, back microbes in question and what we actually want to remove microorganisms can be typically present as biofilms and these biofilms then are adhered to the supporting surface and they provide direct contact between the gaseous pollutant 
and the microbes. The biofilm essentially will be uh, consisting of our pollutant degrader, sometimes also competitors and predators. Generally, bacteria or fungi are commonly adopted for removing hydrophilic, which is water loving, and hydrophobic, which is water uh, hating indoor air pollutants. The microalgae may be also capable of degrading hydrocarbons. And micro uh, microalgae and cyanobacteria may also fix CO2. So, uh, in on the face of it, they look to be uh, very useful uh, methods for uh, removing pollutants from indoor air. So, the first of such things are biotrichnic filters, which generally consist of carrier material. So, this is our biotrichnic filter, which has a carrier material with biomass in it. Now we pass our dirty raw gas through this material and on the other side we put scrubbing water which contains nutrients and other important uh, compounds for maintaining biomass and now our pollutant is basically dissolved in water and then when it comes to the biomass the biomass will uh, you know uptake or degrade this chemical and the result being clean gas will go out. So, basically this is a combination of biofilters and bioscrubbers. Bacteria are immobilized on carrier or filter material. Then a synthetic foam or a structured plastic plaquing would be our filler material, filter material and the surface will allow for the bonding to biomass. Now the carrier material is covered with water which is falling from down, uh, which is falling from uh, bottom to uh, up top to bottom. The pollutant absorbs in the liquid film and then is decomposed by the bacteria and in principle this could remove VOCs and particulate matter, but we need to have enough contact time. So, the compound in question must you know uh, absorb in the liquid film and then uh, have enough time to be decomposed by the bacteria. Here we will have uh, microorganisms that are immobilized. So, these are also same biofilters only where polluted air is coming and water supply is coming and as air passes the hydrophobic pollutant will move from the water phase to the biofilm and then this biofilm will subsequently degrade the pollutant and then we are going to have the treated air coming out. Then we have other botanical based technologies such as membrane bioreactor. So, here we have polluted air coming down to up with there is a membrane. So, this is our air flow, this is the membrane and there is a biofilm on the other side of the membrane and we have the recirculation of biomass happening here. So, these membrane bioreactors separate a nutrient solution contain microorganisms on one side. So, that is this green color and contaminated air flow in a counter current mode on the other side. So, see if this circulation is happening top to bottom and polluted air is coming bottom to top. So, this physical separation of streams may allow for improved mass transfer of pollutant from air to this uh, uh, solution and uh, we have a biofilm also in this place and which basically you know helps in the degradation. We need to control the biofilm and the nutrient supply for this to work and it is actually an expensive method. Then we have capillary bioreactors. So, we will have a segmented flow either moving upward or back uh, downwards and consisting of alternative sections of gas and liquid. So, you see gas, liquid, gas, liquid. So, we will have this alternating uh, pattern going up and being circulated and the mass transfer of pollutants is then enhanced by this in, uh, internal circulation, uh, but it is, uh, it is something that is still developing and the maintenance of this segment water liquid or gas liquid, gas liquid flow is not that easy also. Then we have these microalgal reactors in which we have uh, this biomass circulation top to down, polluted air down to top 
as we have somehow uh, you know radiation in the sunlight uh, band or even sunlight which uh, helps the microalgae fix co2 and so basically this light is going to you know enhance the photosynthesis in this area in this reactor and then o2 will be released to ambient air so this kind of microalgal reactors can be thought of being applied in places where we have high co2 level such as maybe highly occupied closed buildings or schools or malls things like that these botanical technologies have also disadvantages uh, they may be inefficient when compared with the conventional technologies that are already in use uh, because one reason could be that the conventional technologies right now have already been gone uh, have already gone through uh, iteration process in optimizing their performance and the botanical technologies may be somewhat new and need more uh, development uh, these technologies uh, can lead to formation of secondary waste also the emission of biogenic VOCs which may result in the formation of secondary organic aerosol. One may need high residence time for the degradation to actually take place and these technologies may also have some maintenance issues. Uh, therefore as such more research is needed on their applications and in, in improving their uh, efficiencies. Now in summary we have found now that there may be no single equipment or technology for all indoor air pollutants and to treat them in a cost effective manner. So yeah we need to uh, either combine them or do more research in, uh, in you know uh, further refining these technologies. A range of technologies have been proposed for both gaseous and particulate removal. These are physical in nature or chemical and also biological and all of them have their advantages and all of them have some or the other drawback. Therefore at the current situation a careful planning and execution is needed for having an effective uh, pollution control of uh, pollution control for the indoor air.